decisions. Life is a never-ending series of decisions. And being faced with an endless procession of moral dilemmas, personal preferences and potential outcomes. Without a decision, our lives cannot move forwards or backwards. They simply stall and stagnate. We make billions of decisions every day, from the clothes we wear, to the food we eat, to the places we go, to the people we see. With each decision ranging from the massive, the middling, to the microscopic. From the birth of a baby, to the blink of an eye. And yet, conscious or not, everything is decided. Each decision has two outcomes, right or wrong, with varying degrees of success or failure in between. And although our choices are often based on prior knowledge and experience garnered from similar circumstances, sometimes we still make the wrong decision for what we feel is the right reason. If we learn from our mistakes, bad decisions can make us stronger, wiser and braver. They can make us, but they can also break us, with even the most inconsequential decisions proving fatal. During the murders of Ruth First, Muriel Eady, Beryl and Geraldine Evans, one other person beyond Reg Christie was a resident at Ten Rillington Place. But being sweet, polite and timid, she remained hidden in her husband's shadow. And yet 20 years earlier, when her life had hit a crossroads, she had made a bad decision for good reasons, which would bring about her death. Some of what follows is based on the killer's own memories and perspectives. So what part of this story is true is up to you. My name is Michael. I'm your tour guide. This is Murder Mile, and I present to you part six of the full, true, and untold story of the other side of Ten Rillington Place. Today, I'm standing one street east of Rillington Place, on the junction of Ladbroke Grove and Lancaster Road. On the northwest corner, is the boarded up remnants of the KPH public house. On the northeast corner is the floristry shop where David Griffin's refreshment room once stood. And on the southeast corner is the North Kensington Public Library at 108 Labra Grove. Opened in 1891, after the Public Libraries Act of 1850 gave each borough in the United Kingdom the power to provide everyone regardless of age, race, sex or gender, with books, knowledge and an education for life. North Kensington was one of London's first public libraries. As an imposing two-storey building, with long ominous windows, black wrought iron gates and a dark shadowy door, as it looms over the street like a screaming face, it doesn't look welcoming. But with the inside being outdated, like most libraries, it's mostly empty. Except for several soft seats which soak up old people's whittle. A musty damp smell which could easily be a dead tramp. A moaning minnie going shush at the tinnitus in her ears. An old deer getting moist over the mere mention of a trouser protuberance in a Mills and Boone. And a backwards boy ending up bent double owing to a brief flash of boob in a photography book. Ah, great days, Michael. Great days. Sadly, with plans to turn it into a prep school for posh little shits, the taxpaying public are being booted out as the seeds of Satan with silver spoons up their shrinkers are moved in, paying almost six grand a term to be educated and entirely defeating the reason why the library was built. And yet, it was here in the peace and solitude of North Kensington Library, clutching a well-thumbed copy of the Penny Poets, that Ethel Christie came to escape, having married a murderer. At 9.45pm on Friday the 2nd of December 1949, in Notting Hill Police Station, Timothy John Evans made his third and final confession. 
She was incurring one debt after another, and I couldn't stand it no longer. I came home about 6.30pm. She started to argue and threw a bottle of milk at me, so I hit her across the face with a flat of my hand. In a fit of temper, I grabbed a piece of rope and strangled her with it. When I knew everything was quiet, I wrapped my wife's body in a green tablecloth. I tied it with a piece of cord, carried her down to the wash house, placed it under the sink and blocked it in with pieces of wood. I locked the wash house door and I slipped back upstairs while the Christies were still in bed. On Thursday evening, I got my baby from her cot. I picked up my tie and I strangled her with it. And in a strangely detailed confession, which the exhausted and grief-stricken husband, father and fantasist had made only after the police had informed him how, where and when the bodies of his wife and baby were found. Having signed his confession as accurate and true, Tim the Terrible Liar sighed. It's a great relief to get it off my chest. I feel better already. And with that, Timothy John Evans was charged with the murders of Beryl and Geraldine Evans, and the case was closed. Prior to the 2nd of December 1949, Ten Rillington Place was just an anonymous tumble-down terraced house, tucked away in a gloomy dead end amidst the craters, rubble and waste of West London. But now, it was infamous and with two constables stood guard by the wash house, two posted by the front door, and several having cordoned off the street to hold back the throng of gawkers, gossips and giggling kids, as the rapid burst of flashbulbs bathed the unlit street in a blinding white light. Into an ambulance were loaded two corpses, both curled up, one as big as a bundle of rags, one as small as a shoebox. In the front room, the Christies sat several feet apart, Ethel on the sofa, Reg in his armchair, his face giddy with glee as he snipped cuttings about the Evans killings from the newspaper, circled his name and stashed each article in his little brown suitcase of treasured memories. Being a timid and fragile lady, with frayed nerves, sullen eyes and a haggard face, Ethel tried to hide from the horror of the last few days, with a hot tea, a roaring fire, and a book of poetry. But with her home sullied by a fetid stench, every time she breathed, she smelled death. Ethel looked older than her fifty-one years, and being a shadow of her former self, all that was left was a pale, dowdy, and downtrodden woman, haunted by three decades of bad decisions. Ethel, he's only gone and killed the baby. No, Tim wouldn't do that. I'm telling you, that's what he's gone and done. Strangled them both. As a migraine creeped in, with no kiss, hug or eye contact, Ethel muttered, I'm off to bed now. Night, Reg. Which he ignored, as he snipped another cutting about the killings. And as her slippers shuffled down the dark drab hall, past the deck chair, the gas stove, the glass square jar, the length of rope, the wash house, the fence propped up by half a human thigh bone, and their garden where two bodies still rotted in shallow graves. As Ethel curled up on the bed, her portly frame nestled into the deep recess of the mattress, where Ruth first was strangled, and soon Ethel would be too. Ethel Simpson was born on the 28th of March, 1898, the youngest of three children to William, the foreman at an iron foundry, and Amy, a full-time mother, with older siblings Henry and Lily. As an upper working class family, raised in the industrial town of Halifax, West Yorkshire, with a proud father who protected his flock and ensured their safety and stability, a doting mother who kept her brood warm, safe and well-fed, and all three siblings having developed a strong, stable bond, which would remain till their dying days. Ethel couldn't have asked for a better start. 
Sadly, in 1904, tragedy struck when William died. And with his untimely death, having left Amy with Henry aged 10, Lily aged 5, and Ethel aged just 3, living in an era which was unjust to single mothers, life could have collapsed. But with William having provided for their future, Amy being their rock, and the siblings being close, the Simpson family weathered this tragedy and flourished. Described as refined, well-bred and educated, although she lived in the stifling surroundings of a post-Victorian era, Ethel was very much a modern woman. She was self-sufficient, having started work aged 13 as a milliner's assistant. She was skilled, being trained in shorthand, and being blessed with her father's work ethic and her mother's family bond, being a deeply maternal woman with a dream that, one day, she would have a family of her own. Although timid and reserved, Ethel was intelligent. As a child, Ethel was instilled with a deep love of poetry. Absorbing the literary greats like Shakespeare, Robert Burns, John Keats, Walter Scott and Elizabeth Barrett Browning, which fueled her sensitive heart with dreams of romance. And as a keen writer with a lifelong love of language, every Christmas and birthday, without fail, Ethel would send cards to her friends, family and co-workers, having signed it from Ethel, and later in life, from Ethel and Reg. Eager to find true love, being a shapely petite brunette, with a warm smile, soft skin and a motherly nature, who was impeccably dressed, well-spoken and always polite, Ethel easily attracted the attention of men. But being such a romantic soul, she needed this man to be special. But in the autumn of 1919, whilst working as a typist for John Sutcliffe's woolen mill, Ethel met a young clerk. He was kind, caring and a good listener. A bespectacled man with a small frame, a sweet nature and a soft whispering voice. And as a decorated war hero, with dreams of continuing his training as a doctor, soon she began to trust him and to love him. The young clerk's name was John. But I prefer it if you call me Reg. Eight months later, on the 10th of May 1920, in Halifax Registry Office, Miss Ethel Simpson became Mrs. Ethel Christie. And in the first of three bad decisions, made for good reasons, she married her murderer. Married life for the Christies started badly. Having moved into a cosy little flat at number 9 Brunswick Road in Halifax, although they ate well and the rent was paid, it was Ethel's strong work ethic and her secretarial skills for garside engineering in Bradford which kept them afloat. As with Reg living off a disability award of just 8 shillings a week and unable to hold down a regular job for more than a few months, Ethel became the breadwinner, whilst Reg was always broke. With her sister Lily having given birth to a baby boy called Edwin, and as a deeply maternal woman who wanted to become a mum, with Reg plagued with impotence, the Christie struggled to conceive. And even though, after many months of stress and failure, a baby began to grow inside Ethel, having cruelly suffered a miscarriage, their hopes of having a family fell apart. And as their marital bed chilled, their love life became distant, cold and unaffectionate. Then, on the 12th of April 1921, 11 months into their marriage, as Ethel grieved the loss of her baby, Reg was found guilty of stealing postal orders whilst working as a postman and sentenced to three months hard labour in Strangeways Prison. Although shocked, Ethel supported her husband throughout. But having later been sentenced to a further 12 months probation for obtaining money under false pretenses, after his second conviction on the 15th of January 1924, Reg deserted his wife, 
and disappeared from her life. With no goodbye, no excuse and no reason. Reg Christie had simply vanished. Married for just two and a half years, although distraught, being a strong, skilled and self-sufficient woman who was educated, refined and attractive, Ethel was given a second chance at a new life. In 1924, Ethel worked as a typist for the English Electric Company in Bradford. She was quiet but polite, friendly but reserved, and remaining loyal to her colleagues and the company even after she was laid off. Every year, for the rest of her life, she would send them all a Christmas card, signed from Ethel. In 1928, having moved in with her brother Henry at number 63 Hindhouse Lane in Sheffield, and with her sister Lily, brother-in-law Arthur, and nephew Edwin at number 61, she was surrounded by family. That same year, whilst dancing at the Abbeydale Ballroom, Ethel met and fell in love with a prosperous businessman called Vaughan Brindley. And just like her, he was loyal, quiet and loving. He didn't drink, smoke or lie. And best of all, he made her happy. For those four years, Ethel's life was bliss. She had a steady job as a typist at Savile Steelworks. She lived side by side with her beloved siblings. And being besotted by Ethel, Vaughan Brindley began to talk of wedding bells and babies in a life which would have been pure poetry. But Ethel had lied. Stunned by the revelations that she wasn't a widow, that Reg wasn't dead, that she was still married, and that she could never have children. As his business collapsed, so did their love affair. And as a deeply moral woman, weighed down by guilt and failure, in the second of three bad decisions, made for good reasons, she gave Reg one last chance. In February 1934, nine years after he had deserted her, Ethel travelled from Sheffield to South London to see her husband. He was thinner, smaller and paler. And with thick glasses, false teeth and a bald head, he looked feeble and pathetic. And being dressed in ill-fitting blue fatigues, having come to the end of a three-month sentence for car theft in Wandsworth Prison and two prior offences for larceny and malicious wounding, Reg apologised and promised that, if she took him back, he would change. And he did. Turning his back on petty crime, across the next 20 years of their marriage, he held down three full-time jobs. As a cinema doorman at the Commodore, a driver for Ultra Electric, and a clerk for the post office. He served his country during wartime as a special constable, and as a law-abiding, teetotal, respectable married man with a love of animals and gardening, he remained by her side. In December 1938, having lived on the second floor since the summer, as the Smith family moved out, Ethel and Reg Christie moved into the ground floor flat of an old Victorian terrace. It wasn't a great flat. The bricks crumbled, the floors creaked, and the walls shook as the tube trains thundered by. And with no electric lights, only gas, a garden with no privacy, and a wash house and lavatory shared with the other tenants. It wasn't much. But to Ethel, Reg, and their dog Judy, Ten Rillington Place was home. And yet, this new veneer of respectability helped her husband to hide his darker side. And as the years went on, lacking any love, romance or affection, as the stresses and strains of married life took their toll, Ethel went from slim to rotund, elegant to frumpy and attractive to sallow. 
and as her health deteriorated, being plagued with migraines, rheumatism and varicose veins, she retreated into solitude, silence and remained hidden in her husband's shadow. In the sanctuary of the North Kensington Library, Ethel whiled away many hours, absorbing poetry and writing letters to friends and family. Her words were always heartfelt, her wishes were always thoughtful, and her kisses were always true. But as a deeply private woman, she never expressed the fears that she faced. With war declared and their marriage strained, the safety of the library wasn't enough. And as Ethel's stays with her siblings, Henry and Lily, grew longer and more frequent, she never spoke ill of Reg. Not once, during the twenty years that they lived under the same roof, sat in the same chairs, or slept in the same bed. But the signs were there. The loose floorboards under the front room, the uneven bumps in the back garden, the locked brown suitcase under the sofa, Judy digging up unusual bones, the milky white stick that propped up the fence, the strange stains on her bedsheets, the deck chair with the missing length of rope, the square glass jar with the rubber tubing, and his obsession with Beryl Evans, who he often spied on through a hole in the kitchen door. So what Ethel actually knew, we shall never know. But on Tuesday the 8th of November 1949, as she lay in the deep recess of her once badly stained double bed, she may have heard this, here, give us a hand, lad. From two floors above. And two days later... Ethel, he's only gone and killed the baby. No, Tim wouldn't do that. I'm telling you, that's what he's gone and done. Strangled them both. It was shortly after that, in the winter of 1949, that Ethel's trips to see her siblings suddenly stopped. And in the third of three bad decisions, made for good reasons, whether through loyalty or fear, Ethel Christie lied to protect her husband. On the 11th of January 1950, in court one of the Old Bailey, Timothy John Evans, you stand accused of the murder of your wife and daughter. How do you plead? Not guilty. And with that, the prosecution called their chief witness, who, unlike Tim the Terrible Liar, was a happily married man, 29 years to be precise, a former special constable, commended twice, and a decorated war hero, awarded the British War and Victory Medal. In court, Christie stated, About midnight, my wife and I were startled by a bang. I heard something very heavy being moved. I don't think I saw Timothy Evans on the Wednesday till about 11pm. I was in my bedroom. He was coming in and my wife put the whole light on. Beryl and the baby weren't with him. I asked him where they were and he said they'd gone to Bristol. When asked if he had any training as a doctor, Christie replied, No. When asked if he knew a young couple in Acton, Christie replied, No. When asked if he had performed an abortion on Beryl Evans, Christie replied, No. All of which was the truth. And his story was corroborated, in court, by Ethel. On the 14th of January 1950, after three days of evidence, including a stained green tablecloth, a set of pink baby clothes, a man's blue tie with a red stripe, and three false confessions made to the police. After just 40 minutes of deliberation, Timothy John Evans was found guilty of murder. And although Tim was an easily led boy, with a wild imagination, a volatile temper, and a limited grasp on reality, who was barely literate, had an IQ of just 65, and the mental age of an 11-year-old, prison doctors deemed him mentally capable and punishable for his crimes. 
On the 9th of March 1950, at 9am, in the cold grey execution chamber of Pentonville Prison, Albert Pierpoint, a master of his craft, so skilled that a convict could go from sitting down in a seat to dangling from a rope in just seven seconds, placed the prisoner on a twin trap door, and with an eight-foot drop, a sudden stop, two fractured vertebrae, and a severed spinal cord. Timothy John Evans was dead. An innocent man had been hung. A guilty man had walked free. And no one was any the wiser but Ethel. For the next two years, she remained with Reg in the dank, dark ruins of Tenrillington Place. The carpets were as frayed as her nerves, the bricks as broken as her heart, and the walls dripped with the fetid stench of death, as their home, the street, and their names were forever besmirched by the murders. Growing fatter, weaker, and paler, as the stresses and strains of sharing a roof, a room, and a bed, with a liar, a fantasist, and a sexual sadist, ate at her soul. Being too sick to work, too scared to sleep, and with their arguments occurring almost nightly, 54-year-old Ethel Christie was plagued by migraines. On Friday the 12th of December 1952, Ethel dropped off a quilt, a bedsheet, and two pillowcases to Maxwell Laundries at 138 Wolmer Road. She received a receipt, but never collected them. Later, she returned a copy of Penny Poets No. 2 to the North Kensington Public Library, but she never took another book out. On the Saturday, she watched television with Rosina Swan at No. 9 Rillington Place, an almost daily event which would never happen again. And oddly, that Christmas, Ethel Christie would only send one card to one person, her sister Lily, and with her rheumatism having supposedly crippled her hands, the card was written by Reg. On the morning of Sunday the 14th of December 1952, I remember waking and finding her shaking violently. Her face was all blue and she was choking. I tried to restore her breathing, but it was hopeless. I got out of bed and there was this bottle of blue capsules, which I had got from the hospital for my insomnia. Beside it was half a cup of water and only two pills were left when there should have been 25. It were too late to call for assistance. I couldn't bear to see her like this. So I got a stocking, tied it round her neck, and put her to sleep. And there she lay, on the bed, for several days. All bloated and blue, a black stocking tied tight and buried deep into her swollen neck. And with a locked door and no one to disturb him, her naked body was his to do with as he wished. Only he didn't. As her corpse slowly called, he wouldn't grope, kiss, mutilate or rape her as he had done with the others. And as inactive as their sex life was when she was alive, it would remain so when she was dead. Mourning the loss of his wife of 32 years, in his own perverse way, I think in my mind, I didn't want to lose her. Having wrapped her rigid and decomposing body in a blue flannel bedsheet, tied it shut with a safety pin, covered her aghast face with a pillowcase, and strangely positioned a makeshift nappy made from a woolen vest between her legs, he pried up the loose floorboards of the front room, and in a cold shallow grave, he covered her with dirt. 54-year-old Ethel Christie, the faithful friend, the grieving mother, and the forgiving wife, who was timid, kind and caring, intelligent, refined and once beautiful, was buried one foot below her own sofa, where most nights she sat, silently by the fire, reading poetry and dreaming of happier times, with her brother Henry, 
her sister Lily, and the life that she could have had with her lover, Vaughn Brindley. Had she not made three bad decisions, for good reasons. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. If you enjoyed parts one to six of this ten-part series, part seven of The Other Side of Ten Rillington Place continues next Thursday with an omnibus edition once it's finished. And for any murky milers, stay tuned for the verbal equivalent of dribbly bum squids after the break. But before that, here's my recommended podcasts of the week, which are Brew Crime and Disturbed State. This is Brew Crime, a craft beer and true crime podcast. I'm Mike. And I am Beck, and we are your hosts. On Brew Crime, we each take a true crime story and we pair it with a craft beer. You can find our show on your favorite podcast apps. If you can't find it, contact us and we'll try to change that. We can be found at www.brewcrime.com or on Twitter at Brew Crime and also on all the social media platforms for Pacific Beer Chat at Pacific Beer Chat. We can also be found at brewcrime at pacificbeerchat.com. Join us as we discuss depraved killers, stupid criminals, and likely some completely unrelated tangents. Cheers. Cheers. If you like listening to disturbing crimes by disturbing people told by a slightly disturbed host, then you should go check out Disturbed State Podcast. And I am your slightly disturbed host, Chandra. This is a weekly true crime podcast, and I am a one-woman show that does everything research writing recording editing i would love to be in your ear holes go give it a listen it's available on all major platforms stay disturbed a big thank you to my new patreon supporters whose kind donations have been wisely spent traveling to and from the national archives to fact check this current series and prepare us all for season three. Ooh. So this week's absolute legends are Jerry Katz, Lee's Rosenlund, Anne Divine Pride, Mandy Lang, and Suzanne Fox. Thank you, folks. You are the glacé cherry on my Belgian bun. And as a very special Christmas treat, I would like to wish a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to Stephanie Bucker from Texas. Yes, Stephanie, I mean you. I wanted to say to you, have yourself a truly fabulous holiday, stay safe, which is the murder mile motto, and give an extra special smooch to Matthew, as he, being the loveliest husband ever, organized this just for you. Merry Christmas, Stephanie. And if any other murder mile listeners are currently screaming at their spouse or loved ones, hurling sprouts at their head and shouting, why aren't you as amazing as Matthew? You too can arrange a special shout out via the Murder Mile merch shop. Just click on the link in the show notes. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult With No Name. Thank you for listening and sleep well. Hey, Murder Marlers. I'm going to start this slightly differently this time. So normally what happens is uh, I stop recording. Uh, well, I don't stop recording. It stays on. Computer stays on. And then I go off and open up all my doors and stuff like that. Uh, and then I go off and make the tea. And then I come back and take a deep breath. And then uh, and then I go off and uh, when the tea starts wailing, I go and do that. But this time I've decided to do it different. I'm going to start Murder Marl different. So I've literally just finished the record. Just opening up the door so I can get some air in. Gonna put some water in the kettle. Water which comes from bottled water. Uh, I, fill, I fill it because I don't like to have the taps on all the time. So I fill up uh, two litre bottles of water and I have them stashed around. Whoa! Knocked it 
over. So that means I don't. Um, that means I don't have the water pump on all the time because the thing is, especially in winter, if if uh, one of the pipes break on the boat and the water pump is on and I'm not in, the boat could flood and people forget that. So, this is the bit that normally gets cut out. This is the, well, it's not the bit that gets cut out. Yeah, it is the bit that gets cut out actually. Yeah, so I do actually edit. I do edit, there we go. Uh, there is a small edit between murder mile and extra mile. So I'm just making my tea, adding some candorel, the sweetener, uh, adding some coffee mate. Uh, with a cup of tea, a nice bit of PG, and I don't have a biscuit today because there's no good cake shops where I am. But oh damn, how am I out of breath just doing that? That's that's not good, is it? Um, but what, what I do have with me is some Tim Tams, Tim Tams, double coat Tim Tams. Um, Curtis, courtesy of Christy McClue. Thank you, Christy. Uh, very kindly sent all the way from the, the, the tropical uh, wilds of Australia. Uh, wow, wow, foreign climbs. Uh, sent me loads of goodies. So loads of Tim Tams and what was it? Anzacs and those, the uh, ginger nuts. Uh, I just want to say out of the four packs of Tim Tams, the double pack of Anzacs, the ginger nuts uh, and the, the Vegemite. Vegemite. Okay, half the Vegemite is gone. I'm down to the last pack of Tim Tams. I know I'm on the double coat chocolate ones now. They're about to go. Dark chocolate was really nice. Uh, and I've got one pack of uh, ginger nuts left, and that's it. I know I pigged out. I did tell you I was going to pig out. I don't have, I have no compunction. Literally, if I open a pack, I can't help it. Like it's a chocolate bar. Literally, I'll, I can't have a one bit. I have to have the whole lot. And I'll, I'll slowly go through it and go, I'm not going to eat it all, but I do end up eating it all. Oh, right, waffle has started already. Well done, everyone. We're waffling away. Uh, so, uh, usual thing, everyone, this is extra mile, the waffly bit at the end. You can switch off if you want to. You probably already have. Uh, that's not a problem at all. This is kind of the extra bit on top where we learn a lot about the extra bits about the case. So if you enjoy this, you enjoy this even more. Uh, but it's unedited. There's no sound effects. Uh, it's just me waffling and currently staring at my kettle trying to work out when it's going to boil so where am i at the moment obviously i live on a boat i'm moving around i'm in west london now i've moved myself at the back of paddington station uh in a little place called little venice which you will recognize from one of the earlier episodes i think it might be 23 uh in the canal killer series that we did so i'm about 20 feet away from the body of where Marta Ligman was found. So uh, uh, she was the Polish lady who, a uh, violent uh, boyfriend called Tomasz, who was a massive wanker. Uh, he's still in prison, thank God. Uh, he murdered her, uh, wrapped her body in a suitcase, dumped it in the canal. It floated down to here, and they're still not too sure whether she was alive or dead Whether he dumped, when he dumped the uh, suitcase. That's episode 23. Um, I'm literally two streets away from Sussex Gardens where uh, Doris June, who was the fourth the fourth uh, person that the Blackout Ripper murdered, but the sixth victim technically. Uh, so uh, her house is not too far away. Uh, I'm not too far away from Catherine Mulcahy, uh, who was the, if you remember, she was, she was technically the sixth victim of the, of the Blackout, no, the fifth victim of the Blackout Ripper. She was the one where he... Um, he tried to strangle her, but because she was wearing her boots, she gave him a damn good kicking in the stomach. And he was like, oh, shit, she's a bit of a tough cookie. Um, so uh, I'm near to her house as well. And I've moored up here as well because I'm near to some other Reg Christie locations. There's some other ones that are going to crop up later in the series because obviously, what's this, Ep 6 at the moment? Yeah, Ep 6. This, I'm, gearing, I'm writing Ep 7 at the moment, which hap the locations are not too far from here. Obviously, you'll notice in the series that normally I would do this is the murder location, but because Reg did all of the murders inside Ten Rillington Place, I, I'm not going to keep going back and going. Well, today we're at Ten Rillington Place because you know that, you know that we know we know that we're there. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm tying the what I like to do, like I did with the Dennis Nielsen one, that is instead of taking you to Muswell Hill to show you where he lived, which I did do, what I was doing is showing you key locations where where. Um, where Christy met his victims or where he kind of got to know them quite well. Because I think that's just as important as where someone dies. It's kind of how did they meet a serial killer? How, how, did, 
how does a normal person meet another person who they think is normal and then all of a sudden it's like wow um i think it's the uh, it, i think it makes it more real it brings it to life for you if like you know um you were walking down the street and you started chatting to someone who was very nice you just and you went to tesco's together to buy some tim tams to buy some tim tams and then all of a sudden you were murdered I think it, I think I think it's that normality that makes everything real. That's why I try not to be too sensational here and go. Do you know? Do you know my hatred of stories about there was a killer and he did cut people's heads off and then he used that as a foot? I hate that shit. I really do. I just like I like I like showing you how the normality of murder and how it can happen to anyone. It's not. I think as I said before, you listen to those stories about there was a killer and he cut a head off. And he was bad and he was mad. You listen to that, you're just distancing yourself from the truth. Whereas a lot of these murders, these aren't... A lot of these people are just picked out of nowhere. Like Christie really is... Except for Beryl, who he really fancied. And his wife, who... Mm, whether he wanted to get her out of the way, we don't really know. But the others, literally, they didn't really know him. They were, they, they were just strangers in a crowd. That he kind of decided he was going to pick. But... It could have been anyone else. Really, there were they, they, there's no real rhyme or reason why he picked the ones that he did, uh, which makes I think it makes it more exciting. So that's why that's why I like trying to show the normality of murder, not that murder is normal. Kettle's gonna brew. Look at it going. I've only put a little bit in. Oh, I'm gonna have a nice cup of tea. Nice cup of PG. PG. Oh, lovely. You can't beat a good PG. Do you know what? I've worked out. I don't even know what PG stands for. Let's find out. PG tips, which is, uh, does it have royal seal of approval? It probably does. What does PG stand for? I hope it's not Procter & Gamble. It probably is, isn't it? It's probably Procter & Gamble. You know what? Well, it's owned by Lu Unilever. You know what? On the box, it doesn't say what PG stands for. I'm going to find out. I'm going to find out what PG tips st stands for. That's going to be my mission today. After I've done my laundry. Because it is currently, today is the 13th of December. Uh, so you will have received episode four, or part four of this series. The Timothy uh, John Evans episode today. So I hope that's... As I'm recording this, you're probably listening to that. So I've done the next one, which is Geraldine Evans. I think that went quite well. That was interesting. And I quite enjoyed writing this one as well, the Ethel one. It was a bit of a bitch to write. It took me a week, whereas it should take three days. Part of that was down to the fact that I was invited to the Acast Christmas party, which is very good. So Acast is obviously a podcast host. They invited us to a party. I got very drunk. Uh... Ben from They Walk Among Us got very drunk. <laughs> we all got... I met some very lovely people. I met um, the producer and the sound recordist from uh, Dan Snow's History Hit. They were really nice. Uh, uh, what was that guy? Intelligence Squared. I, I, I met I met Mark from Intelligence Squared. Another podcast I need to check out. That was very good. Loads of other good people. So, But we got very drunk. So that kind of delayed me by a day. And even though I'm hungover today, because I met I met up with uh, the Tood, the Lups, and unfortunately not the Scouser, because again he flaked on us. But flaky Scouser. Got a bit of a hangover this morning. I wasn't going to record this morning, but I thought, sod it. <laughs> Couple of painkillers. Whack. Let's get into it. So, good night. Good night. It was had by all, though. Very good. Although I was in bed by about 10 o'clock. I know, I'm quite sad. I'm in my 40s now. I don't do lates. So... Uh, <laughs> See, I did it at the ACAS Christmas party. Like, I think... I th um, I think it was about 11 o'clock. I know, it's a bit sad, isn't it? Like, suggesting that was late. And I don't remember getting home at all. Even though I'd moored up my boat, like a 20-minute walk away from where the party was. It was in their office. It was very nice. There was free booze all night, which was very good. There was... Um, and I'd had something to... Did I, did I eat before I left? I don't remember. Anyway, uh... I know. I remember stumbling through a council estate on the way uh, on the way back. I remember because normally I dodge the kind of the estates because it's kind of it's Hoxton, it's kind of East London area. So do you know, there were, like everywhere in London, there's pockets that you kind of you kind of avoid at midnight. You know, you don't you, as a drunk you don't walk through those areas all drunk. Do you know, because you, you can be a target for as you can anywhere. But I, you try and stay to the lit areas. For some reason, I ended up in uh, uh, all the 
all the kind of dodgy council estates walking along holding a kebab. GPS kebab, as we call it. You're always staring at your kebab, but somehow I made it home. I have no idea. I don't remember getting home. I, I just woke up in the morning and thought, oh, my God. And then moved the boat the next day. <sighs> Did four locks, two tunnels. It took me about four hours. I was hung over, really badly hung over. And I almost fell out the boat twice. Anyway, let's get into this episode. Hope you enjoyed that. This was the Ethel Christie episode. A bit of a pig to write because it's... We get into the point now where um, there's a lot of strands from the other stories starting to come back into this story. And I'm, what I'm trying to do is make sure that you don't forget the other episodes. Because obviously, you know, you listen to a lot of podcasts. And because we're weekly, if you're a binge listener, that's fine. And when you listen to the Omnibus edition, which I'll do at the end, which won't have extra mile, it's just going to be Omnibus. It's going to be all all 10 episodes back to back you'll be able to enjoy it in one long run but at the moment i know it's difficult because you're kind of like where were we last week if you want to you can re-listen to the episode and make me some extra money that'd be lovely um but uh so i'm trying to i'm trying to make sure that you don't forget about things like ruth first and mural ed and then you don't forget the key points that we've stated about uh beryl evans and geraldine and then timothy evans and then obviously we had to deal with the the court case of timothy evans in this one which i've kind of zipped through very quickly i've done a glossed version but don't worry we will be we'll be coming back to that later on if you if you think oh michael hasn't told the story about the trial properly what i've deliberately done is just told you the bare essentials here because there are things that i need to tell you later on so so don't send me a message saying you haven't told the story properly yet it's like no you know don't don't complain about the story on episode six when it's a ten part series. Uh which I know I know someone out there is probably preparing an email now going, I think you'll find it's like, oh don't. Uh so here's some extra details. Uh some of the things that people always get wrong is they have a tendency to uh list Ethel Simpson um as Ethel Waddington Simpson or sometimes just Ethel Waddington. Uh and I'm gonna get rid of that now. Ethel Simpson who later became Ethel Christie, uh, is Ethel Simpson. So where the confusion actually arises is William Simpson, her father, was born before the marriage of his mother, Maria Simpson, to her new husband, his stepfather, who was Edward Waddington. Uh, So her father is William Simpson, but later in life, he became William Waddington. Um, Now, Ethel's brother, Henry, he had a tendency to style himself as Henry Simpson Waddington, which always made it really, really... That was his choice. He was allowed to do that. It made it really difficult for a lot of researchers over the years to find out stuff about Ethel's life and stuff like that because there was a Simpson Waddington and Waddington Simpson. It was all very confusing. Um, and quite often people list Ethel Simpson, knee, uh, or Christie, as Ethel Simpson Waddington, but she's not. She's Ethel Simpson, not Simpson Waddington, as is written. Um, and what also makes it confusing as well is that uh, Lily Simpson, her sister, married Ethel Cecil Bartle, and she became Ethel, Eth- uh, sorry, Lily Bartle, right? Uh, which I, I've tried not to put that into this episode. I've, tried, I've just kept calling her Lily. I've tried not using her new married name because it just confuses stuff already. She will crop up in later episodes. Uh, but just to say that she's no relation to Bar- Bartle Road, where... Willington Place now is well Willington Place used to be which is Bartle Road now and no relation to the James Bartle Ironworks which used to be on that site got that out of the way that was good right um I thought it was nice what I tried to do with this episode is a lot of people especially you know I've mentioned the film a couple of times 10 Willington Place and I thought they didn't the BBC did a nice uh three-part series with Tim Roth and Emily Mortimer called Willington Place uh that was really that was really i thought that was really good some strong performances a very nice performance by emily mortimer of um of ethel christie uh but everyone does seem to uh focus on the same thing like obviously around the time that everything was going really badly i mean really badly just before a murder when she was living with reg obviously she'd put on a lot of weight she'd become very dowdy she was quite pale she was quite sickly do you know her her kind of vava vroom had gone her energy do you know the, the, there was a lot of missing of her life and that's how people depict her 
But actually, when you look back at her past, she's very much a different woman. She's very kind of independent. Joe, she's 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 a little bit shy. But you know what? Apart from that, she's she's uh, she's intelligent. She's independent. She knows how to make her own money. She's got great skills. She's got real drive. You know, she could stick with a job for years. She, uh, everyone said she was very diligent and you know, not a big chatty person. Uh, but she she would. She would often talk very highly of her sister and her brother, and she really loved her nephew. Rarely talked about Reg, ever, to anyone. That was the one kind of the thing that most. She always wore the wedding ring throughout, but she never discussed Reg with anyone. It was kind of a real no-go thing. Uh, but everyone said she was a really lovely lady, and that's what I wanted to get across with this, and to get across the fact that oh, I try and I try and post it online for you. But there was a picture out there that I found. Mostly, you will see the picture of her. In the back garden, a picture of Reg took, and she's, you know, she's 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 packed on the pounds. You know, she's in her fifties. Life hasn't been good to her. She's packed on the pounds a bit, uh, and she, you know, she doesn't look. She's kind of the 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 kind of dumpy frumpy image that everyone imagines. But there's an old picture on there that I saw of her in her twenties, and she's really glamorous. She's really attractive. You know, she's really really well styled and well groomed, and that's what everyone said. She's well styled, well groomed, very refined. Um, and that's really what I'd, I wanted to get. Oh, a love of poetry, absolutely love poetry, very educated. That's really what I wanted to get across with this story, is to tell the different side of the story, is the fact that Ethel... Yes, there's Ethel Christie, the kind of the dumpy, downtrodden woman who lives in Reg Christie's shadow. But there's also Ethel Simpson, who is kind of, you know, she could have been something great. She could have been... Do you know, she, she was... She wouldn't have been a great leader or anything like that, but you know, she was going, you know, independent woman growing up in the post Victorian era, just she had it all going for her, really. So, um, I just wanted to show that, you know, there were a lot of opportunities where she could have gone on and had a, the great life that she deserved. And you know what? We would know nothing about her now. She would have just, she would be dead by now. She would have lived a long, happy life. Uh, she may have had some kids, maybe. Uh, she may have adopted or, or become a stepmom or something. And, every, and she would have got married and had a good life. And you know what? We wouldn't be talking about her now because she would just be an anonymous person who had a good life and nothing exciting happened to her. And that's great. But instead she became a, a victim and that's why we're talking about her now. Um, so I wanted to tell her story that way. And also it kind of gives a bit of an insight into their marital life. Uh, and also Reg's past. This is what I wanted to really get at is some more details about Reg's past. Uh, there will be an episode at the end, episode 10, which will be a cradle to grave of Reg. So we, so don't worry, there will be all your questions will be answered in episode 10. You'll be going like, OK, why is all this happening? What I'm doing now is really feeding you kind of information. Uh, cup of tea time. I'm moving away from the mic. Oh, cup of tea. Cup of tea and a Tim Tam. Double coat Tim Tom. Tim Tom? I'm going to call it Tim Tom. Really, um, for those for those of us who don't really know uh, what Tim Tams are, I would say, I would say they're kind of, the nearest we have is kind of penguins. They're kind of like a penguin, but they're kind of a little bit smaller, but the chocolate's thicker. Although it is on this one because it's double coat. Uh, but yeah, they're very nice. I haven't done a Tim Tam Slam yet. I'm working on it, guys. I'm working on it. Um, I enjoy eating chocolate. I don't like making a mess. And I don't like dunking my tea and biscuits either. It's a, tea and biscuits, biscuits and tea. <sighs> anyway. Um, so other things that we've discussed in here is that obviously I, I, I've led you in a little bit of an uh, extra information about Christie's criminal record. So obviously... He uh, put across the idea that he was kind of a happily married man and, you know, a special constable and a decorated war hero. And we'll go into much of that in episode 10. But when he was with Ethel, like within a year of um, them getting married, and obviously they were only courting for about eight months anyway, uh, he ended up in prison for three months for stealing postal orders whilst he was employed as a postman. This is fascinating when you think about it. He was convicted of stealing postal orders whilst working as a postman, and then 20 years later he was hired by the post office as a clerk. Mm. 
interesting well done post office uh it was a lenient sentence given the serious of seriousness of the offense uh because he had a previous good criminal record and he'd uh his war service had stood him in good stead um when, i'm reading this bit obviously you can tell when he left strangeways prison in june 1921 uh after serving his sentence he went to stay with his parents now i I had put this in the story, but I edited it out because it slowed it down. But I thought that was interesting. He he, he left prison, and then instead of going back to Ethel, because they were living in the same house together, he went to stay with his parents. Um, and he did did this for uh, the next couple of years. Um, now, whilst whilst he was living with his parents, this can't be proven because uh, there's no police record for it. But during their time during his time back at his parents house his parents house was burgled and it is believed that he was the culprit although no charges uh property was taken but no charge charges were pressed against him but obviously he was he was known for theft um <coughs> uh, the second time he was arrested uh obviously that he was obtaining money under false pretenses and was given 12 months probation which basically just meant uh if you do it again within the next 12 months or you do anything again within the next 12 months you will be sent to prison um so uh, after that he left halifax never to return now christie stated uh that the reason that he left his wife was because he said that she was having an affair with her pl- employer mr garside who was the owner of garside engineering in bradford which is where he worked uh there's no evidence of that uh, obviously Ethel was quite quiet but she was an attractive lady and she did uh, she did pull uh, Mr Vaughan later on so so do you know what there there could be a possibility there um, but or he could be confusing this with something else we don't know so uh, it's entirely possible uh, Tim's execution I didn't put this in the episode but I think it, I think it's quite important I, with Tim's execution I didn't want to drag it out because I needed us to get to the even though we know Tim's gonna end up well maybe he didn't I don't know um the important murder in that episode I see I was gonna put Tim's execution in the Tim at Tim's episode but I felt it was worth holding it out to the Ethel Christie episode because what this does is this really solidifies the fact that she lied on behalf of uh Reg Christie against timothy evans but clearly she would have known that tim evans almost certainly was innocent so when when he was executed an innocent man was executed that must have weighed really heavy on her so that's why i thought it was really important if i i didn't change the timelines at all i just made it so because because the correlation between them you know even though it was about two years apart between her death and tim's death it was i very much made his death part of her story which i think worked a lot better so tim's execution um uh just before while he was in prison he was given the uh Terman test which is basically uh to assess his mental ability uh they said that he's, he had the mental age of a 10 and a half year old i've put 11 year old just because i hate halves in there what's the point to it they said a 10 and a half year old uh suggesting that he was borderline feeble-minded but not mentally incapable uh, on the morning of the execution uh he had his last wish which was to have a glass of whiskey which he was given um uh, obviously uh, offenders could have uh, prisoners could have whatever they want really uh and that was it uh this was something i thought was quite bad um so even though he was a lapsed roman catholic uh they said do you want a mass held uh before you die and he was like yep that'd be great i'd love that you know so uh father francis held a mat a mass for timothy evans in uh pentonville prison and he was able to attend it was a private mass the problem was father francis waffled on for far too long and the execution had to take place uh at 9 a.m um so the mass wasn't completed literally uh, even though there was a mass for timothy evans he couldn't hear any of it because it was like right we need to go and get you executed now so uh courtesy of father francis who waffled um he couldn't hear his own mass maybe that's a blessing i don't know uh i would rather i'd rather do something fun than listen to a mass if i'm going to be killed uh, um maybe that's it i'm not religious so there we go um 
Maybe listen to an episode of Murder Mile. Mm. Or drink from a Murder Mile mug and eat a Tim Tam. There you go. There you go. I thought I'd read this for you. Uh, this was a statement that I didn't put in. I've put in bits of it. But I didn't put it all in. This was a statement that Christie gave to the police on the 1st of December 1949. So uh, this would be before the bodies were found, I believe, if my brain is correct. Before the bodies were found uh, and before Tim was charged with the murders of Beryl and Geraldine. So this is Reggie's statement. I'm not going to use Reggie's voice, but this is it's, it's a slightly large statement. But here we go. Um, during my tenant. During my tenancy, my wife and I have become very friendly with Mr. and Mrs. Evans, although we have never been out with them. About two months ago, my wife told me that Mrs. Evans was again pregnant. If you notice throughout this, um, this is me again, hello, uh, you'll notice throughout this that Reg Christie puts all of the onus on the fact that it was Beryl Evans and his wife who were doing the talking and my wife said this, my wife told me this, is he's, he's in complete denial of the fact that he had he's literally saying, I have nothing to do with Mrs. Beryl Evans. This is what this is what oh, my wife told me. Uh, my wife, hey Dave, my wife. Um so, um about two months ago, my wife told me that Mrs. Evans was again pregnant and my wife informed me that she was acting very silly in trying to bring about her own miscarriage by taking pills and syringing herself with glycerin and carbolic soap. Mrs. Evans uh, did, tell, did tell the wife that she was doing that she was doing this about six weeks ago uh, and I said to her in my wife's presence that she was looking a physical wreck and advised her to stop it. We warned her of the consequences and she promised us both that she would stop taking the stuff. The next day, Mr Evans came down and said that any pills or similar things uh, that had been found in the place had been destroyed. Mr and Mrs Evans got on very badly together. They were always rowing and Mrs Evans told my wife, my wife and I, it was my wife and I or just my wife, on more than one occasion that he had assaulted her and grabbed her, grabbed her of the throat. Um... She said he had a violent temper and one time he would do her in. Uh, four months passed, I believe I might have miswritten that. Four months passed, Mr and Mrs Evans had been talking about leaving the premises and we rather hoped they would. They were heavily in debt. A few days after the 5th of November 1949, Mrs Evans told me that they were clearing out because they were expecting because they expected to get a council house and to, and to cover this mrs evans went to her mother-in-law's mrs probert's on that thomasina probert on st mark's road uh, where to deceive the council she was supposed to only have one room i last saw um mrs evans on the 8th of november 1949 when she was going out into the street obviously we know that he was if that was true, he was probably looking through the little peephole in his kitchen that I mentioned about earlier on, of which he had to stand on a little stool to spy on her. That might crop up later on in uh, some later episodes. Uh, they use that in the in the TV series. That was quite nice. But it's a nice detail that that is actually true. Um, uh, where was I? Uh, I last saw Mrs. Beryl Evans on the 8th of November 1949 when she was going out into the street. I took no special notice of this. Yeah, right. Uh, but later that day, when Mr. Evans came in at about 7pm, he told my wife and I that his wife and child had gone to Bristol with friends for a short holiday and that, they, and that he was going down later in the week to visit them. About the 11th of November, uh, Mr. Evans told my wife and I that he was going to sell his furniture and give up the place. The previous day, the 10th of November, Evans told me that he had given up his job as a motor driver for Lancaster Bakeries, which is literally just down the road on uh, Lancaster Road. On, the on Monday, the 14th of November, 1949, a plain maroon coloured van called at the house. Uh, this is, this is uh, Robert J. Hooker's van, so this is all true. Uh, called at the house and removed Evans' furniture. That's accurate. Uh, Mr. Evans was present when this was done. That's correct. At about quarter of an hour later... After the van had left, Mr. Evans showed me a wad of notes and told me he got £60 for the furniture. It was actually 40 but he was right. It was a wad of notes. It was in uh, £1 notes, the, the larger £1 notes. It was a big old wad in his hand. Uh, at the same time, he handed me two suitcases. There were two suitcases, a pram and a baby's chair. That's correct, but it was 
Christie who told him to pack those. He, he, did, he wasn't handed them. Well, technically he was handed them. But it was Christie who told him to do it. Which he asked me to keep until he could either send or call for it themself when they had settled. Which obviously is a lie because Reg had told him that he was going to send them to the nice young couple in East Acton. Um, I agreed to do this. But I did not know until the cases were opened by the police on the 1st of December 1949 what they contained. Ooh, burp. What it contained, which was bullshit. Not that there was bullshit in the suitcase, but what Reg is saying. He knew he knew it was full of baby clothes. Because obviously he told him to cut up all of Beryl's clothes and everything else and just put baby clothes in there to make it look make him feel like the baby wasn't gonna be murdered, was going to a nice young couple in East Acton. Uh, about 5 p.m. on the 23rd of November 1949, Evans called at my place. This is what I was saying last time that um Evans did return back to Rillington Place very briefly between the period of the 14th when he disappeared and when he was brought back by the police on the 2nd of December. Uh, so about 5.30 p.m. on the 23rd of November 1949, Dennis Nielsen's birthday, uh, he would have been, yeah, yeah, it is actually. Um, Evans called at my place. I expressed surprise uh, at seeing him and I understand... I understood he was going to Bristol to see his wife. He told me he had been to Bristol, Cardiff, Coventry, Birmingham and back to Cardiff from where he had just come. He had said he had been looking for work but had been unsuccessful. My wife asked how Mrs Evans was. He replied she was all right but she had walked out on him. Uh, he did not say uh, where she had walked out on... He did not say where she had walked out on him uh, but had said... But we had said we were not surprised. Oh, I'm struggling now. Uh, Mr. E Mr. Evans did not remain with us very long, and I have not seen him since. At no time have I assisted or attempted to abort Mrs. Evans or any other woman. As far as, as, far as I know, I have never seen Mrs. Evans or her child in an unconscious state, nor have they been seriously ill whilst staying at Ten Rillington Place. I cannot understand why Evans should make any accusations against me as I've been really good to him in a lot of ways. Uh, it is very well known, very well known locally, that he is a liar. And my wife and I have expressed the opinion that we think he is a bit mental. Which I did use that line earlier on. Uh, so that was, so that was, that was Reg being his usual shitty self as always. Um, so... I hope that was interesting. I hope that was good. That was just some extra stuff in there. So uh, we've got Extra Mile next week. Uh, so that will be the start of the new year. That will be, I, th I can't remember what date that is. I think it's like the 4th or something. You'll hear that episode. So that'll be episode 7. That will be, this will be 7, 8, 9 and 10. So we've got three more victims that most people have never heard of. Uh, because everyone really just focuses on oh big stretch because oh. most people just focus on the uh timothy john evans beryl evans uh geraldine evans and ethel christie story around reg which is the which is important you know because it led to it led to very much big changes in the um uh, the abolition of the death penalty in the united kingdom because obviously I'm not going to get go, go into it too much because we will go into it later on. But obviously, Reg was uh, sorry. Tim was uh, executed in 1950, uh, and then we have the culmination of Reg's story. And then by 1960, there were other court cases that happened around the same time. If you look at the uh, the Charlotte Street robbery episode, I did that led to it as well. Uh, obviously, we've got Derek Bentley, famous case in the United Kingdom. If you've seen a film called Let Him Have It, that's about that case. Uh, we've got Ruth Ellis as well, The Last Woman Hanged. That kind of leads to some of it as well. Um, so, uh, obviously, by 1960, it had already gone through Parliament, the abolition of the death penalty. Uh, and by 1965, it was entirely abolished. So, uh, but this was one of the key cases. This is this is why this case is so famous because it's it really led to the point where people were like, "Hang on, do you know there was an arrogance for years of people going, well, we have the best law system in the world.'" And you go, "Well, do you know it's only as good as the people who run it and the people and you know the witnesses who are, do you know who give their evidence and and what evidence is allowed to be put forward." So. Um, 
you know, even even like uh, uh no no i'm not going to go into that so uh, uh it's um yeah so it's a really important case and uh we will uh be d discussing it in full at the end what i might do at the end i think is as an extra episode because there's a lot of questions in here what i might do as kind of an extra mile episode is just do a q and a just say to everyone send me your questions and i'll try and answer them Whew, so i hope you enjoyed that that was good fun i enjoyed that my hangover's gone um i'm now going to do a little bit of editing on this i'm going to go and wash wash do my laundry lovely jubbly uh listen to some podcasts while i'm doing that have a tim tam uh next week i will be emptying my money pot as i mentioned because it's the, the 13th today i can't remember 13th or 14th whatever it is uh so next week uh when i've done my final tour i do a tour this sunday final public tour and then i do a final tour for the uh, the content team at acast check me out crawly crawly bum lick they're paying they asked for it i that's fine we'll have some fun they're paying me as well which is great uh so that'll be my final tour then i'll do some editing and before i disappear i will empty my pots of money three big pots at the moment full of money uh put it into coinstar go to the supermarket and treat myself to probably nice a nice big roast uh maybe a nice bottle of whiskey because my audience figure my downloads are doing very well i've hit a couple of big targets which is very nice oh oh just hit my laptop sorry laptop uh and i'll buy myself a nice pudding and that'll be nice and then i'll go away for christmas and hopefully hopefully have a day or two off over christmas <sighs> watch some telly and uh, have a bath oh the joys you have no idea you 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 live in the real world or you think you live in the real world with your electricity and your you're running hot water and you can switch on taps and things happen boat life i tell you boat life i because it's 12 volt batteries everything i have to charge the batteries on the boat it's like everything that's that's batteries you have to charge it uh, so you have to make sure it's charged uh i can't just turn on the taps so i have to go and turn on the pump and then turn on the water and and make sure that i'm the, the, my water tank is full because it's not connected to the mains there's no main supply i have to make sure i've got gas bottles because that's where my gas comes from oh and like i i can't i can't just i can't just go oh i'm gonna have a shower like you could in the morning like i used to love doing that like waking up and like all sleepy eyed and walking in and going turn on the shower and just stand there and go oh great days having a shower i can't do that because it takes two hours to char to, to like make hot water here so especially if you in the morning like i need to i need to dive straight into the shower but you can't you've got to switch on the engine wait two hours uh so unfortunately showers are a bit of a rarity so you have to do a bit of a horse bath as they call it uh and or i use i utilize the gym which is very nice do you know it's 20 quid a month and you know free hot showers which is very nice but because i because I, I still look after my grand in scotland hence once a month i do like 800 mile round trip to go and visit a woman who has no idea who i am anymore um when i get there i get into a house because i'm still looking after still maintaining the house because for various reasons um when i get in there first thing i do is switch on the hot water and within like a 24 hour period i will have four baths at least four baths it's like yes just make full use of those baths oh great days no idea how lucky you are <laughs> oh anyway that was murder mile hope you enjoyed it uh good series having fun hope you're enjoying it too uh we'll do this we'll finish by january and then as i said before we'll come back start march uh for season season three with lots of uh new episodes i've no idea what they are yet anyway that was fun uh catch you all soon stay safe have a good christmas uh or uh, may festive whatever we're all hopefully off on on holiday and a happy new year unless you're chinese because the new year is later or you're jewish because the new year is earlier either way i think that's correct we all have different new years who cares happy non-denominational thingy I was about to say God bless then, but you can't say that when you just say God bless. Anyway, that's me rambling. Okay, gotta go. Bye-bye.